Amen. While you're being seated, welcome Lori Vaughn. Well, good morning. It certainly is wonderful to be back here. When I walk through the doors, it's like walking home again. So I am very grateful to be here this morning. Um, I would like to share some things this morning uh, all about missions. That's what I do. And honestly, if you have chosen Jesus as your Savior, that is what you're to do as well. And this morning, I hope to shed kind of a different light on things, just a bit. I'm not here to guilt you into going somewhere, I promise. Um, but I do want to share some thoughts, and, and I really want to kind of share my story, how I've gotten to the point where I am, and um, how the Lord has been moving and working in my life and the life of those that I'm ministering to and the organization that I'm with as well. So to start things off, I want to kind of tell you about how that call began for me. Um, I accepted Jesus as my Savior when I was seven years old, and I remember it very clearly like it was yesterday. I remember confessing my sins at a young age and knowing I need Jesus because without him, I'm nothing. And so at seven years old, I did that. I remember my baptism very clearly. I remember the pastor who baptized me. I just remember every little detail. Um, it was very significant, a true t turning point in my life. Well, a couple years later, after really being involved in church, my parents had us in church at a very young, well, all my life, at a very young age, literally all my life. And um, I was involved in a program, a missions program at our church and called Girls in Action. Some of you may be familiar with it. And I loved it. It was, I loved going every week because I couldn't wait to hear about the other missionaries and where they're serving and, and what God was doing in the places that they were in. It was absolutely fascinating to me to hear about these other countries and cultures and how really, how could they not have a Bible? How could they not know about Jesus? That just blew my mind. Um, it was very hard for me to fathom. Well, at age, around eight or nine, I wish I could remember that detail. I don't remember. But around eight or nine, I clearly remember the Holy Spirit saying, this is what you're going to do with your life. He placed a call on my life at that age saying, you are going to serve overseas some, at some point in your life. And of course, I was a kid, didn't really know what that meant. To me, I was like, all right, I'm going to Africa. That's where I'm headed. One day, I'm going to be a missionary in Africa. That's what it meant to me. Um, as I got older, the Lord provided so many opportunities to serve in, in different ways. Um, <clears throat> Short-term trips here in the U.S., short-term trips overseas. And that call on my life, that urging to go, was always there. I could not pass it up. It was always there. It always excited me to get on that airplane to go. Not because of the adventure. I'm sure there was a little bit of that. But just, oh, I can't wait to see this group of people. And what is the Lord going to do through that? Um, in the meantime, I became an art teacher. Those were the giftings that the Lord's given me. And I love to paint and draw. I love kids. And so it was a natural fit. So I began teaching here in East Tennessee. Um, I came to Celebration when it was still meeting in a school, and it was really small. Um, the Lord gave me an opportunity to work in children's ministry here and to be a part of that, and then come full-time here. And all of that to me, I mean, it was missions, and it was ministry. And so I was very comfortable and very happy. And, I mean, I love this place, and I love the kids here, and I love the people here. And I was doing just fine just fine. I was like, Lord, I'm ministering. That call you placed on my life, maybe it was just to come here, you know? Maybe that whole overseas part, I don't know. I enjoy it. I love it. Maybe I can satisfy that with these short-term trips, but I love being here. I don't want to go anywhere. Well, I think at those points when you get so comfortable, that's when the Lord said, all right, let's shake up your little world a little bit. And he did call me away from here. And I was so comfortable. It was so hard because I love this place so very much. But he did call me away from here. And I went to Cookville, Tennessee and served in a great, great fellowship there. Um, and during that time, the Lord started just stripping away so many things in my life. Pride. Um, he's just coming, bringing me to a point of total reliance. Now, should I have been there all the time? Absolutely. But I am human. He brought me to just a place of total reliance, and then he said, okay, now you're going to go. You're going to go far away. 
At that point, I'm like, well, awesome. Let's go. I don't have a clue where I'm going. I don't know what that's going to look like. What capacity will this be in? But I'm just going to go. <clears throat> so over a course of about three months, I really prayed. And it's like, God, I'm willing. Show me what to do. Because I just don't know. Now, in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, boy, what do I get to go do? What do I get to go do? How can I serve you? What can I do? What can I do? Do you hear that? What can I do? And realized there's so much more to this whole thing, missions, than just the, what can I do? I'm ready to go, but what can I do? And so this morning, I kind of want to share a little bit of that part um, with you, kind of the switch that the Lord made in my brain, going from what can I go do to what is the true purpose of this? What is this really all about? So I'm going to do that first with a few statistics for you. And now I'm just going to tell you, I'm an artist. I hate numbers. I can't stand them. Um, they stress me out, honestly. They make my stomach hurt when I think about them. But I think these numbers are important. So I do want to share them with you. There's a couple terms here that I want to make sure we're on the same page when we talk about them. One is people group. And I put that definition up there. A people group is the largest group through which the gospel can flow without significant barriers of understanding. So in our world, it's documented that there are about 11,248 people groups. Now, honestly, all M organizations look at these things differently. I'm going with one particular one, okay? So just understand that. Don't say, oh, well, she said that was the number. Everybody looks at it a little bit differently, so this is the one I'm going with. So, thinking about over 11,000 people groups in the world, look at the next number. 6,546 is the number of people groups where evangelical Christians comprise less than 2% of the total population. This describes the country where I live. And where I am, there are about 79 million people, and right at 1% know the Lord. Um, It is a very lost, lost place. Look at the last number, 3,052. This is the number of people groups not engaged by anyone. That means they don't have a copy of the word. They don't have people there sharing truth with them. Now, I don't put these numbers up here to say, you should feel guilty, get out your checkbook, or get on an airplane, okay? That's not why I'm sharing that. What I want you to see is that there is a huge task in front of us, but let's understand what that task looks like. Matthew 24, 14 says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So the end is not going to come until all people groups, all nations, every tribe and every tongue has access to the truth, has heard truth. Do you understand what I'm saying? And we don't do this out of guilt. You see, the task before us, going into every nation to preach the gospel, it is not about what can we go do for God. Let's go do this. It is absolutely about glorifying God. So our passion for missions and for going into the world should be about serving the king of kings, not about, ooh, what can I go do? What's my task? And so for me personally, when I really kind of made that switch in my brain and thought, this is all about serving God and bringing glory to his name. Yes, I want to share truth. Yes, I want to see floods of people come to know him. But honestly, this is about bringing glory and honor to the king. Revelations 5, 9 says this, And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. It goes on to say in, chapter, in this chapter in verse 12, In a loud voice, they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Amen. And if that doesn't get you fired up for missions, I don't know what does. Because honestly, that is what this task 
is all about. The word missions, my prayer, when you hear that, yes, I want you to see the children in Africa and the tribes in the jungle. I want you to see all of these ends of the earth. But my prayer is that, more importantly, you will see Jesus, that you will see, I want to bring honor and glory to him, and I can do that through sharing truth. Because that's my purpose on this earth, is to bring glory and honor to him. Now, this task is huge, isn't it? In fact, many of you think, there's no way I'm going to go sit in a hut in Africa somewhere, right? The task is very big, but our God is so much bigger than this task. He's so much bigger than the numbers that you saw on the screen and that I read to you. Those are very overwhelming, and honestly, it saddens my heart. I hope that you are bleeding, your heart is bleeding for the people in these places who've never understood what peace really looks like and joy really looks like because they need Jesus desperately. But more importantly, I want you to see that God can equip you prepare you and provide for you everything you need for this task to go. But honestly, it requires one thing of you. It really requires you to obey. And that's kind of where I want to get into this next segment here. So I told you the Lord said, all right, it's time for you to go. I had no clue where I was headed. I didn't know what that would look like, but I began praying very earnestly. Lord, I know I'm supposed to go. I just don't know what this looks like. So <clears throat> in January of 2012, our church that I was serving at at the time had a corporate fasting for 21 days. And I felt like, you know, this is something I really need to be a part of. The Lord was pressing on me. You need to do this. And so during that time, a lot of amazing things happened and came from it with family and church. And it, it was truly one of those stones of remembrances. It was wonderful. But during that time, the Lord said, okay, you're going to use education because that's where I've gifted you, so let's use your strengths here. And by the end of that fasting, he said, I want you to actively pursue places. Now, up to that point, I felt like, Lord, you're going to take me somewhere. You're going to drop it in my lap because I don't want to go before you and try to figure this out. But at the end of that fasting, literally the night that I finished that 21-day fast, the Lord said, get on the internet, and I want you to start looking. Within 10 minutes, I found the organization that I'm currently serving with, and I spent about an hour just looking at every aspect of that website. There were videos, and I was like, finally, my passion and love for education and for children and ministering to them are all wrapped up into this one thing, this one organization. And so I looked at that and thought, I've got to check this out. Now, it is the internet, right? So I'm not stupid. I realize that I can't go and put all my eggs in this basket and think, this is it. But they just so happen to be having a job fair within two weeks in Tennessee. So I went. I met several directors of schools. And finally, I was there and thought, this is it. This is the real deal. These people are legit. It's not just an internet scam. This is for real. And I have to do this. Fast forward, that was February by the time I went to the job fair. By August, I was in country. And so I'm not telling you any of this to say, oh, look at her. She's so good. She, she went. I'm telling you, I never in a million years thought that I would end up in the Middle East, first of all. But it wasn't about where I was going. It wasn't about what I was going to do. It was all about the obey part. I knew when I left Celebration to go to Cookville, which was one of the hardest decisions I ever had to make, I knew that if I didn't obey and move, that I would be in just pure disobedience to the Lord. And honestly, I didn't want the consequences of that. I knew that if I did not leave Cookville and move overseas, that I would not be in obedience. So it wasn't about, oh, what's the task that I get to do? It was truly about Am I willing to obey? And that is the bottom line of all of this. Are you willing to obey and to go? So let's take a look at a couple of verses. If you have your Bible, or you're, of course, welcome to look up here at the screen. Turn to Matthew 4, 
18 through 22. Now, I realize you've probably read this a hundred times, right? And you're just like, oh yeah, we're supposed to be fishers of men. In preschool, we have goldfish crackers we give to the kids to illustrate it, right? I mean, it is, this is a solid verse. We're very familiar with when we talk about missions. But I want to point out a few things that really stuck in my mind when I was in the middle of this journey and figuring out where I was supposed to go. So it says, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Now, I want to point out a couple of things to me that really stand out beyond the, I want you to be fishers of men. The things that, follow, that really stand out to me most are these. Come, follow me. It was the direction that Jesus gave, right? And... I'll send you, of course, to be fishers of men. At once, I think that's pretty important, at once they left. They left. Left everything there, just dropped it, took off. Jesus called them. So Jesus gave an instruction, right? Jesus called, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. So in these verses, we're focusing on Jesus saying, this is what I want you to do. I want you to get up and go. He called them to be a part of this ministry, and they didn't twiddle their thumbs and think, well, I don't know, maybe I should go home and pack up my house, and you know, oh gosh, what do I need? Boy, I need to go to Walmart and get my Band-Aids and my first aid kits, and you know, it wasn't, let's just sit around and figure this out. Oh, what is my family going to think? They're going to freak out. Oh, my word. You know, at once, immediately, they took off. They followed him. They left their job, their livelihood. They left their father and let me tell you something. I have been a part of the leaving the family part. Whew. It is hard stuff. But the passion that they had to say, you know what, we're going to go. They went immediately. So it really is about Jesus saying, I'm calling you to do this. Now get up and go. They obeyed. Jesus called. The disciples obeyed. And I bring that in front of you because, again, when I told you I felt like leaving he here, celebration, and then leaving America to go overseas, it was about an obedience thing. It wasn't about, oh, this huge task of how I'm going to serve God. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? It was about obeying him and bringing glory to the Father, bottom line. And the reason I bring this up to you is because I think missions is such a hefty thing and we get overwhelmed by everything and all the possibilities because there's a million wonderful organizations out there that do great things. Really, is God speaking to you saying, you know what? I want you to obey me and glorify me. I'll help you figure out the rest. <clears throat> Matthew 28, 19 says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So again, we're kind of fast-forwarding to when Jesus is, is going up into heaven and he gave another instruction for his disciples. He said, go. And you know what? The disciples did what? They obeyed. They went. In fact, you can track all of that until now. Look at the early church. Look how it began. It began right where I serve. And then we have this church that we're sitting in right now. Because Jesus said, go. And they went. They obeyed. They obeyed to bring glory and honor to the Lamb. So the task before us, the word missions, is great. But the instructions are really very simple. Jesus said, go, we must obey. So I guess my question for you this morning, here it is, how will you go? What does that look like for you? <clears throat> I urge you, first of all, to confidently pray for the spread of the gospel. You know, every single believer in the world should be on their knees doing this. Don't forget about your neighbor next door who does not know Jesus. Get on your knees and pray for them. 
do not forget about the people who moved in across the street from another country wearing something that looks really weird to you, thinking, oh, I don't want to touch them with a 10-foot pole. Get on your knees and pray for them because they need Jesus. Don't forget about the people in other states, even Alaska, the number one unchurched state in this, in this country, in some parts, actually feel like an underdeveloped country. Pray for the people there who need the Lord. Get on your knees confidently and urgently praying for people in those unreached places. See, all of us can go and pray, every single one of us. So I urge you to pray confidently for the Lord to make a difference in their lives. I urge you to give sacrificially. You know, the Lord might not be saying, pack your bags, take off. But he does call us all to give sacrificially, whether it be in a monetary way or to go, and obviously both. And again, I'm not asking for your money. I'm saying pray and ask God, how are you supposed to give sacrificially to further the kingdom? Because again, this is not about the task of doing something. It's about bringing honor and glory to the Father. And so through our tithes and offerings, we can do that. And three, I urge you to pray and listen for maybe your call to pack your bags and go. You may be sitting there thinking, oh, in a million years, I will never leave this soil. I'll never pack my bags and go. I'll never pack my bags and move across the country. But you know what? The Lord may have something in store for you that you would never imagine. I'm telling you something. I knew when I was a little girl that I would go somewhere. I knew it. And so when I did, and the time came, my parents were like, well, I, this is going to be hard, and it is going to be sad for us, but our sacrifice is giving you to the Lord to do that. And so I knew that I would go. I knew I would end up somewhere one day. Now, my brother, on the other hand, completely different situation. He's a pastor, and he um, is very much committed to the Lord, but never in a million years thought that he would go. He's gone, too. He's overseas as well. And again, leaving the family and going, it is the hardest part, for sure. And my parents were like, okay, we, you, we expect it. I can't believe your brother's going and taking all of our grandkids with him, you know? But he also realized, as I did, to stay is disobedience. We have to go. And he said something when he got ready to go, and it really stuck with me, so I wanted to bring it up. When he got ready to go, he said, you know, I realized that my default should be to go, and then God will tell me if I'm supposed to stay. And that's how we began to look at it. That really kind of struck a chord with me. Of course, I knew I was going, but I thought, wow, for him to be in a place where he never thought he would go somewhere, to have that switch was pretty huge. And I thought it was a good thing to really think about. Now, God may not be calling you to pack your bags to move overseas. Maybe he is, maybe not. But he absolutely is calling you to think about your neighbor, to think about the people across town, to think about the people across to another state or across the ocean. So today, I am not bringing all of these things before you, the goes, to make you feel guilty, like, oh, I should be doing more. I'm asking you to join in glorifying the Father and bringing honor to him through your obedience to go. Um, so now I've been in the Middle East for two years. And once I arrived and I was there, now don't get me wrong, it is not a bed of roses all the time, for sure. It is hard. There are some days, culturally, that I want to pull my hair out so I'm thinking, oh, why can't they just be organized? I just want an organization because I love it so much. There are things that make me crazy. But in the, at the end of the day, I sit back and think, there's absolutely no place I would rather be because I, I know this is where the Lord has planted me to bloom. And I'm so grateful for it. So if you will give me just a few minutes, I would like to share with you um, what that looks like on a daily basis. I wanna share some faces with you. Uh, I'm gonna ask you to really pray for them. I'm not gonna mention names um, on stage, but if you 
maybe even could jot down some things that I tell you about these kids. They're amazing. I love them, and I really want to see their lives changed for the Lord. Um, so I serve at this school right here in the Middle East. This is just a picture of one of my little kindergartners um, who is an absolute doll, and her family has just been called back to their, their home country, so I won't get to see her again. Um, but she is a precious young lady whose family is not of our faith. Um, so I would ask you to pray for her. But this is what our school looks like. Um, we have children from over 40 different countries in our school. So when the verse says, go into all nations, I literally feel like I'm walking into the United Nations when I go to work in the morning um, because I have kids from so many different places that I get to interact with. In our school, we have all of their flags represented, and of course, ours as well. So the organi organization that I serve with we have 4,700 students. We're ministering to 100 nations. We have 19 schools in 15 different countries. And like I said, my school uh, ministers to over 40 different nations with 250 students. And our goal is reaching the world for Christ through international Christian education. Our goal truly is to provide a quality education for our students. But the Lord provides opportunities to integrate truth in our lessons, um, how we um, interact with the kids, they're seeing something very different. One thing that even the neighbors, um, you know, the local neighbors surrounding our school have said over and over and over, they say there is light coming from that place. We don't understand it, we don't get it, but there is light there. Even the lost that don't know are looking at the school, and I'm not, please understand, they're, they're looking at Jesus in us saying, there is light in this place. This looks so different. How we interact with our students are like, you're so loving to these kids. It's just such a different, um, a different environment. And our neighbors recognize it. Again, I'm not saying, whoo, good job for being loving. It's all about what Jesus is doing in this particular place. So this is my homeroom. I'm, like I said, I teach art. I teach K-4 through 12th grade art. Um, this past year, I taught Bible, 9th and 10th grade as well. Um, this coming year, I'll also, I've dropped a class. I'm still teaching art so that I can also do administrative work. I'll be um, the assistant secondary principal this coming year as well. But we each have a homeroom, and we get to interact with them regularly. This Picture in the top corner is just one of our class parties, hanging out, enjoying each other. And that is kind of the beauty. We, we are encouraged and we are expected to spend time with our kids. Um, we have parties for them so that we can just hang out, get to know them. Every year we have Christmas and Easter parties. The children have to sign, or their parents have to sign permission forms to allow them to come. But it is so exciting when you have a class full of kids where the parents have said, yes, you can go, you can hear about Jesus and who would never step foot in a church, or who won't even let them take Bible class, but they'll allow them to come to the parties. In fact, there is one little girl in this bottom picture, and she's been in our school since she was really little. This is seventh grade, but she's never been allowed to come to the Christmas party, and this year she did. And I got to share truth with her. I got to say, this is who Jesus is from beginning to end. This is what he's done for you. And so we have opportunities that you never would imagine just because we get to build relationships with these kids. Um, this is my classroom, and I put this picture in here because the lady on the right, she is a local artist um, whom I've become friends with, and fortunately she speaks English because my language stinks. She's great, and um, we're able to communicate with one another. I love her dearly. I've been able to share truth with her. She's not seeking, but she's open. Um, but she came into my class to uh, teach um, a, a traditional art form. And we do have opportunities to interact with the community. Those opportunities are more limited because our goal is not to go be immersed in the culture. Our goal is to serve our kids. So it's been neat to see how the Lord's given us opportunities to, to interact with our culture as well. And she is a fantastic lady um, whom I dearly love. And I put her picture also there for you to see her, to pray for her, to pray for her salvation and pray for more interactions with her this next year. Um, these, all of these girls right here have such 
a great story. Um, and I, I'm not going to go in depth into any of them. I, I will... I will spare you, but I do want you to pray very specifically for them. Again, I can't mention their names, but the lady in the top, um, the top left corner, she um, accepted Christ this year. Our small fellowship has a youth group. She went on the youth retreat, and she accepted the Lord. She got off the bus. I was there. My nephew got to go, so I picked him up, and she's like, Miss Vaughn. She ran, and she grabbed me. She's like, you're not going to believe it, but I asked Jesus to be my Savior. And I was so excited because I had been praying that very specific thing for her during this retreat. Um, we had had some conversations leading up to it. And during the time after the retreat, she would show up in my room at every single break, just hang out, just want to talk about random things, but talk about what the Lord was doing in her life. And I said, Can, you know, I would love to just meet with you kind of one-on-one. -on -one. So I got permission from her mom. And then through a series of events, um, her mom was not open to the Lord, and, and through a great deal of spiritual warfare, kind of cut that connection off. Um, they are leaving. They've been transferred to another country. So I put her picture up there to ask you to pray that the Lord would continue to stir in her heart. His word is enough. The Holy Spirit is enough. She doesn't need me to disciple her, but I ask you to pray that the Lord continues to do a mighty work and that her roots will just grow very, very, very deep in the Lord. The young lady right underneath that picture, the little mustache, um, she is a dear, dear child. Um, she is very unique and she has some um, phenomenal abilities. The language has really been difficult for her um, to learning English, but she is a sweet, sweet child. And I, I so desire for her to know the Lord. Um, her family are not believers, but they're willing to listen and, and to have her in our school. And, and she really has experienced for the first time what love really is within an environment outside of her home. Um, she has had a great deal of struggles in schools prior to coming to ours. So her family is experiencing the love of Christ in such a new in fresh way and I just ask you to pray for her that they would continue to seek. The picture at the top is actually my house and I have a group of girls come to my house every other Tuesday for a Bible study at night and all of the girls except one are believing girls. They, are, they love the Lord so very much and, and they have such an opportunity to share truth with their friends, even in a deeper way than we do, and they do. And I'm excited that I can disciple them and pour into them because they are really being the hands and feet of Jesus around them. The one young lady on the left, um, she's also in the bottom picture, she came very diligently every week, every week that we met, um, asking questions, seeking. Her parents were okay with it, she has not accepted Christ, but I feel like she is on the verge. Um, their family is moving to the Middle East in a, in a different country this coming year. So I ask that you would pray for her, that the Lord would provide people to surround her who are believers, and I pray that, um, that she will come to know the Lord. I love Facebook. It's a great way to keep in touch with these kids, but, but do please lift her up and pray for her. The ladies, um, other two ladies in the bottom picture... They have made professions of faith as well. Um, the one on the far right is going back to her home country this year. And so I just, again, ask that you would pray for their hearts, pray that they would build strong roots um, and a strong foundation without the environment that they've been in with our school this past several years. So I shared these stories with you to see, man, God is at work. And you know what? I never in a thousand years would have imagined when I was nine years old that I would be where I am getting to know these kids, loving them with all my heart, and asking you to pray for them. And I tell you that because it is not about what the Lord's using me to do. It's not about these kids even. It's about obedience to him and bringing glory and honor to him. So as we prepare for another year, um, at our school, I would like for you to keep these things in mind and to pray for these things. Pray for the seeds of truth that have been planted in the hearts of our students. Pray that they will take root. 
Pray for each of our teachers as we prepare for the 2014-15 school year. Pray as we leave our families and friends. Pray as we raise partial support for this upcoming year. Pray for continued peace in our country. Pray that nothing will hinder our opportunity to serve in this place. Um, we have great favor with the government, great favor within our community, and I, it is a miracle, and, and I could be here all day telling you miracle after miracle of how our school is even allowed to operate where we are. Um, so I do ask that you pray that the Lord will continue to grant that favor for us to minister in that place. Um, as I kind of close today, I just want to go back and read the verse from Revelations to you again. Revelations um, verse 12. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea, and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. I am so looking forward to that day when every nation, every tongue, every tribe is together lifting our voices in praise to the Lamb. <clears throat> I have one more little story for you. At Christmas time, our small fellowship, there obviously are not many options for church there. So um, there is a small international Protestant church that I go to. And the Lord laid upon several members of the church to do this Christmas concert for our community. Now, it's really hard without giving you lots of detail for you to understand how weird that would be for people in our community, okay? So just... Just think, this would be weird. In America, it'd be awesome. There, I mean, you, you don't celebrate Christmas, okay? So they started praying. They got, you know, the whole congregation involved. Um, they started putting together choirs in four different languages. I got to sing with the, with the English choir. And we started practicing and rehearsing and preparing for this huge concert. We were going to rent out... Um, we did rent out a ballroom at this hotel in our community. And... We just began praying and inviting our neighbors, mind you, for a Christmas concert, okay? This is just kind of weird. And the night that we showed up for this concert, you know, again, four choirs prepared to sing in different languages. In fact, we prepared a couple songs where our choir would sing one verse and then the other choir would sing another verse. And, you know, so that you've got all these languages mixed in one song. You know, people just started coming in, and they kept coming in until there was no room left for standing. And hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of our neighbors started showing up for this Christmas concert. And they were hearing truth for the first time, some of them. And as each of our choirs were singing, especially in the songs where we were singing together, I was like, this is a glimpse of heaven. This is is a glimpse of every nation, every tongue, every tribe coming together. Now, I know it's going to be so much better, but it was a picture. I was sitting there with tears in my eyes thinking, oh, Lord, thank you for this opportunity. And it really boiled down to thank you for letting me hear you say go. Thank you for letting me not be disobedient to you. Thank you for this opportunity to bring glory and honor to you because that is what missions is all about. Let's pray. God, we, we just say thank you for who you are, for what you've done for us, for the sacrifice that you've made for us that we so do not deserve. And Lord, I pray if there is any person in this room who has not made a decision to follow you, Lord, I pray that you would just draw them to you right now, that you would break their heart for you and, and they would come to you. Father, I pray for every person in this room, Father, just to prepare them to go, to go across the street, across the community, or maybe across the ocean. Father, I pray that we would bring glory and honor to you in our words and our actions. In Jesus' name, amen.